Section seventy two of Reviews by Oscar Wilde. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cricket. Reviews by Oscar Wilde. Edited by Robert Ross. Section seventy two. A note on some modern poets. Woman's World, December 1888 If I were king, says Mr. Henley in one of his most modest rondeaus, art should aspire, yet ugliness be dear, beauty the shaft should speed with wit for feather, and love, sweet love, should never fall to seer, if I were king. And these lines contain, if not the best criticism of his own work, certainly a very complete statement of his aim and motive as a poet. His little book of verses reveals to us an artist who is seeking to find new methods of expression, and has not merely a delicate sense of beauty and a brilliant fantastic wit, but a real passion also for what is horrible, ugly, or grotesque. No doubt everything that is worthy of existence is also worthy of art. At least one would like to think so. But while echo or mirror can repeat for us a beautiful thing, to render artistically a thing that is ugly requires the most exquisite alchemy of form, the most subtle magic of transformation. To me there is more of the cry of Marcius than of the singing of Apollo in the earlier poems of Mr. Henley's volume, In Hospital, Rhymes and Rhythms, as he calls them. But it is impossible to deny their power. Some of them are like bright, vivid pastels, others like charcoal drawings with dull blacks and murky whites, others like etchings with deeply bitten lines and abrupt contrasts, and clever colour suggestions. In fact, they are like anything and everything, except perfected poems. That they are certainly not. They are still in the twilight. They are preludes, experiments, inspired jottings in a notebook, and should be heralded by a design of genius-making sketches. Rhyme gives architecture as well as melody to verse. It gives that delightful sense of limitation which in all the arts is so pleasurable, and is, indeed, one of the secrets of perfection. It will whisper, as a French critic has said, things unexpected and charming, things with strange and remote relations to each other, and bind them together in indissoluble bonds of beauty. And in his constant rejection of rhyme, Mr. Henley seems to me to have abdicated half his power. He is a roi en exil, who has thrown away some of the strings of his lute, a poet who has forgotten the fairest part of his kingdom. However, all work criticises itself. Here is one of Mr. Henley's inspired jottings. According to the temperament of the reader, it will serve either as a model or as the reverse. As with varnish red and glistening, dripped his hair, his feet were rigid, raised, he settled stiffly sideways, you could see the hurts were spinal. He had fallen from an engine, and been dragged along the metals. It was hopeless, and they knew it, so they covered him and left him. As he lay by fits half-sentient, inarticulately moaning, with his stockinged feet protruded sharp and awkward from the blankets, to his bed there came a woman, stood and looked and sighed a little, and departed without speaking, as himself a few hours after. I was told she was his sweetheart. They were on the eve of marriage. She was quiet as a statue, but her lip was grey and writhen. In this poem the rhythm and the music, such as it is, are obvious, perhaps a little too obvious. In the following I see nothing but ingeniously printed prose. It is a description, and a very accurate one, of a scene in a hospital ward. The medical students are supposed to be crowding round the doctor. What I quote is only a fragment, but the poem itself is a fragment. So shows the ring seen from behind round a contra during his pitch in the street, high shoulders, low shoulders, broad shoulders, narrow ones, round, square and angular, sari and shelf, while from within a voice, gravelly and weightily fluent, sounds, and then ceases, and suddenly, look at the stress of the shoulders, out of a quiver of silence, over the hiss of the spray, comes a low cry, and the sound of breath quick intaken through teeth clenched in resolve, and the master breaks from the crowd and goes, wiping his hands, to the next bed, with his pupils flocking and whispering behind him. 
now one can see. Case number one sits, rather pale, with his bedclothes stripped up and showing his foot, alas for God's image, swaddled in wet white lint, brilliantly hideous with red. Théophile Gautier once said that Flaubert's style was meant to be read, and his own style to be looked at. Mr. Henley's unrhymed rhythms form very dainty designs from a typographical point of view. From the point of view of literature, they are a series of vivid, concentrated impressions, with a keen grip of fact, a terrible actuality, and an almost masterly power of picturesque presentation. But the poetic form, what of that? Well, let us pass to the later poems, to the rondels and rondeaux, the sonnets and cartesanes, the echoes and the ballads. How brilliant and fanciful this is! The Toyokuni colour print that suggested it could not be more delightful. It seems to have kept all the willful fantastic charm of the original. Was I a samurai renowned, too sordid, fierce, immense of bow? A history and angular and profound? A priest? A porter? Child, although I have forgotten clean, I know that in the shade of Fuji sun, what time the cherry orchards blow, I loved you once in old Japan. As here you loiter, flowing gowned and hugely sashed, with pins a row, your quaint head as with flamelets crowned, demure, inviting, even so, when merry maids in Miyako to feel the sweet of the year began, and green gardens to overflow, I loved you once in old Japan. Clear shine the hills, the rice fields round two cranes are circling. Sleepy and slow, a blue canal, the lake's blue bound, breaks at the bamboo bridge, and lo, touched with the sundown spirit and glow, I see you turn with flirted fan against the plum tree's bloomy snow. I loved you once in old Japan. Envoy Dear, twas a dozen lives ago, but that I was a lucky man. The Toyokuni here will show I loved you once in old Japan. This rondelle, too, how light it is and graceful. We'll to the woods and gather may, fresh from the footprints of the rain. We'll to the woods at every vein to drink the spirit of the day. The winds of spring are out at play, the needs of spring in heart and brain. We'll to the woods and gather may, fresh from the footprints of the rain. The world's too near her end, you say. Hark to the blackbird's mad refrain. It waits for her, the vast inane. Then girls, to help her on the way, will to the woods and gather may. There are fine verses also scattered through this little book, some of them very strong, as Out of the night that covers me, black as the pit, from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate, I am the captain of my soul. Others with a true touch of romance, as or ever the nightly years were gone with the old world to the grave, I was a king of Babylon, and you were a Christian slave. And here and there we come across such felicitous phrases as In the sand the gold prow griffin claws a hold, or The spires shine and are changed, and many other graceful and fanciful lines, even the green sky's minor thirds being perfectly right in its place, and a very refreshing bit of affectation in a volume where there is so much that is natural. However, Mr. Henley is not to be judged by samples. Indeed, the most attractive thing in the book is no single poem that is in it, but the strong, humane personality that stands behind both flawless and faulty work alike, and looks out through many masks, some of them beautiful and some grotesque, not a few misshapen. In the case with most of our modern poets, when we have analysed them down to an adjective, we can go no further, or we care to go no further. But with this book it is different. Through these reeds and pipes blows the very breath of life. It seems as if one could put one's hand upon the singer's heart and count its pulsations. There is something wholesome, virile, and sane about the man's soul. Anybody can be reasonable, but to be sane is not common and sane poets are as rare as blue lilies, though they may not be quite so delightful. 
Let the great winds their worst and wildest blow, or the gold weather round us mellow slow. We have fulfilled ourselves, and we can dare, and we can conquer, though we may not share in the rich quiet of the afterglow, what is to come. Is the concluding stanza of the last rondeau, indeed of the last poem in the collection, and the high, serene temper displayed in these lines serves at once as a keynote and keystone to the book. The very lightness and slightness of so much of the work, its careless moods and casual fancies, seem to suggest a nature that is not primarily interested in art, a nature like Sordello's, passionately enamoured of life, one to which lyre and lute are things of less importance. From this mere joy of living, this frank delight in experience for its own sake, this lofty indifference, and momentary unregretted ardours, come all the faults and all the beauties of the volume. But there is this difference between them. The faults are deliberate, and the result of much study. The beauties have the air of fascinating impromptus. Mr. Henley's healthy, if sometimes misapplied, confidence in the myriad suggestions of life gives him his charm. He is made to sing along the highways, not to sit down and write. If he took himself more seriously, his work would become trivial. Mr. William Sharp takes himself very seriously, and has written a preface to his romantic ballads and poems of fantasy, which is, on the whole, the most interesting part of his volume. We are all, it seems, far too cultured, and lack robustness. There are those amongst us, says Mr. Sharp, who would prefer a dexterously turned triolet to such apparently uncouth measures as Thomas the Rhymer or the Ballad of Clark Saunders, who would rather listen to the drawing-room music of the Villanelle than to the wild harp-playing by the Mildams or Benori, or the sough of the night wind or drumly annan water. Such an expression as the drawing-room music of the Villanelle is not very happy, and I cannot imagine any one of the smallest pretensions to culture preferring a dexterously turned triolet to a fine imaginative ballad, as it is only the Philistine who ever dreams of comparing works of art that are absolutely different in motive, in treatment, and in form. If English poetry is in danger, and, according to Mr. Sharp, the poor nymph is in a very critical state, what she has to fear is not the fascination of dainty metre or delicate form, but the predominance of the intellectual spirit over the spirit of beauty. Lord Tennyson dethroned Wordsworth as a literary influence, and later on Mr. Swinburne filled all the mountain valleys with echoes of his own song. The influence today is that of Mr. Browning, and as for the triolets and the rondelles and the careful study of metrical subtleties, these things are merely the signs of a desire for perfection in small things, and of the recognition of poetry as an art. They have had certainly one good result. They have made our minor poets readable, and have not left us entirely at the mercy of geniuses. But, says Mr. Sharp, every one is far too literary. Even Rossetti is too literary. What we want is simplicity and directness of utterance. These should be the dominant characteristics of poetry. Well, is that quite so certain? Are simplicity and directness of utterance absolute essentials for poetry? I think not. They may be admirable for the drama, admirable for all those imitative forms of literature that claim to mirror life in its externals and its accidents, admirable for quiet narrative, admirable in their place. But their place is not everywhere. Poetry has many modes of music. She does not blow through one pipe alone. Directness of utterance is good, but so is the subtle recasting of thought into a new and delightful form. Simplicity is good, but complexity, mystery, strangeness, symbolism, obscurity even, these have their value. Indeed, properly speaking, there is no such thing as style. There are merely styles, that is all. One cannot help feeling, also, that everything that Mr. Sharp says in his preface was said at the beginning of the century by Wordsworth, only where Wordsworth called us back to nature, Mr. Sharp invites us to woo romance. Romance, he tells us, is in the air. A new romantic movement is imminent. I anticipate, he says, that many of our poets, especially those of the youngest generation, will shortly turn towards the ballad as a poetic vehicle, and that the next year or two will see much romantic poetry. The ballad... Well, Mr. Lang, some months ago, signed the death warrant of the Ballard, and, though I hope that in this respect Mr. Lang resembles the Queen in Alice in Wonderland, whose bloodthirsty orders were by general consent never carried into execution, 
it must be admitted that the number of ballads given to us by some of our poets was, perhaps, a little excessive. But the ballad? Sir Patrick Spence, Clark Saunders, Thomas the Rhymer, are these to be our archetypes, our models, the sources of our inspiration? They are certainly great imaginative poems. In Chatterton's Ballad of Charity, Coleridge's Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, the La Belle Dame Sans Merci of Keats, the Sister Helen of Rossetti, we can see what marvellous works of art the spirit of old romance may fashion. But to preach a spirit is one thing, to propose a form is another. It is true that Mr. Sharp warns the rising generation against imitation. A ballad, he reminds them, does not necessarily denote a poem in quatrains and in antique language. But his own poems, as I think will be seen later, are, in their way, warnings, and show the danger of suggesting any definite poetic vehicle. And further, are simplicity and directness of utterance really the dominant characteristics of these old imaginative ballads that Mr. Sharp so enthusiastically, and, in some particulars, so wisely praises? It does not seem to me to be so. We are always apt to think that the voices which sang at the dawn of poetry were simpler, fresher, and more natural than ours, and that the world which the early poets looked at, and through which they walked, had a kind of poetical quality of its own, and could pass almost without changing into song. The snow lies thick now upon Olympus, and its scarped sides are bleak and barren, but once, we fancy, the white feet of the muses brushed the dew from the anemones and the moaning, and at evening came Apollo to sing to the shepherds in the vale. But in this we are merely lending to other ages what we desire, or think we desire, for our own. Our historical sense is at fault. Every century that produces poetry is, so far, an artificial century, and the work that seems to us the most natural and simple product of its time is probably the result of the most deliberate and self-conscious effort, for nature is always behind the age. It takes a great artist to be thoroughly modern. Let us turn to the poems, which have really only the preface to blame for their somewhat late appearance. The best is undoubtedly the weird of Michael Scott, and these stanzas are a fair example of its power. Then Michael Scott laughed long and loud. When shone the moon a hint yon cloud, I spared the towers that saw my birth. Lang, lang, sal wait my cold grey shroud, lang cold and wait my bed of earth. But as by stare he rode full speed, his horse began to pant and bleed. When haim, when haim, my bonny mare, when haim if thou wouldst rest and feed, when haim were nigh the house of stair. But with a shrill heart-bursting yell, the white horse stumbled, plunged, and fell, and loud a summoning voice arose. Is't white horse death that rides frae hell, or Michael Scott that hereby goes? Ah, laird of stair, I ken you well, a vaunt or I your soul shall steal, and send ye howling through the wood, a wild man-wolf, I am on reel and cry upon your holy root. There is a good deal of vigour, no doubt, in these lines but one cannot help asking whether this is to be the common tongue of the future renaissance of Romans. Are we all to talk Scotch, and to speak of the moon as the moon, and the soul as the soul? I hope not. And yet, if this renaissance is to be a vital living thing, it must have its linguistic side. Just as the spiritual development of music and the artistic development of painting have always been accompanied, if not occasioned, by the discovery of some new instrument or some fresh medium, so, in the case of any important literary movement, half of its strength resides in its language. If it does not bring with it a rich and novel mode of expression, it is doomed either to sterility or to imitation. Dialect, archaisms, and the like will not do. Take, for instance, another poem of Mr. Sharp's, a poem which he calls the Date Tide. The wheat salt wind is blowing upon the misty shore, as like a stormy snowing the date goes streaming o'er. The wind drowned date sail wildly, fray out each drumly wave. It's o oh and o oh for the weary sea, and o oh for a quiet grave. This is simply a very clever pastiche, nothing more, and our language is not likely to be permanently enriched by words such as wheat, salt, blowing, and snawing. Even drumly, an adjective of which Mr. Sharp is so fond that he uses it both in prose and verse, seems to me to be hardly an adequate basis for a new romantic movement. However, Mr. Sharp does not always write in dialect. The son of Allen can be read without any difficulty, and fantasy can be read with pleasure. They are both very charming poems in their way, 
and none the less charming because the cadences of the one recall Sister Helen, and the motive of the other reminds us of La Belle Dame Sans Merci. But those who wish thoroughly to enjoy Mr. Sharp's poems should not read his preface, just as those who approve of the preface should avoid reading the poems. I cannot help saying that I think the preface a great mistake. The work that follows it is quite inadequate, and there seems little use in heralding a dawn that rose long ago, and proclaiming a renaissance whose first fruits, if we are to judge them by any high standard of perfection, are of so ordinary a character. Miss Mary Robinson has also written a preface to her little volume, Poems, Ballads, and a Garden Play, but the preface is not very serious, and does not propose any drastic change or any immediate revolution in English literature. Miss Robinson's poems have always the charm of delicate music and graceful expression, but they are perhaps weakest where they try to be strong, and certainly least satisfying where they seek to satisfy. Her fanciful flower-crowned muse, with her tripping steps and pretty, willful ways, should not ride antiphones to the unknowable, or try to grapple with abstract intellectual problems. Hers is not the hand to unveil mysteries, nor hers the strength for the solving of secrets. She should never leave her garden, and as for her wandering out into the desert to ask the Sphinx questions, that should be sternly forbidden to her. Dürer's Melancholica, that serves as the frontispiece to this dainty book, looks sadly out of place. Her seat is with the Sibyls, not with the Nymphs. What has she to do with shepherdesses piping about Darwinism and the eternal mind? However, if the songs of the inner life are not very successful, the spring songs are delightful. They follow each other like wind-blown petals, and make one feel how much more charming flower is than fruit, apple-blossom, than apple. There are some artistic temperaments that should never come to maturity, that should always remain in the region of promise, and should dread autumn with its harvesting more than winter with its frosts. Such seems to me the temperament that this volume reveals. The first poem of the second series, La Belle au Bois Dormant, is worth all the more serious and thoughtful work, and has far more chance of being remembered. It is not always to high aim and lofty ambition that the prize is given. If Daphne had gone to meet Apollo, she would never have known what laurels are. From these fascinating spring lyrics and idols, we pass to the romantic ballads. One artistic faculty Miss Robinson certainly possesses, the faculty of imitation. There is an element of imitation in all the arts. It is to be found in literature as much as in painting, and the danger of valuing it too little is almost as great as the danger of setting too high a value upon it. To catch by dainty mimicry the very mood and manner of antique work, and yet to retain that touch of modern passion without which the old form would be dull and empty, to win from long silent lips some faint echo of their music, and to add to it a music of one's own, to take the mode and fashion of a bygone age, and to experiment with it, and search curiously for its possibilities, there is a pleasure in all this. It is a kind of literary acting, and has something of the charm of the art of the stage player. And how well on the whole Miss Robinson does it! Here is the opening of the ballad of Rudel. There was in all the world of France no singer half so sweet. The first note of his viol brought a crowd into the street. He stepped as young and bright and glad as Angel Gabriel, and only when we heard him sing our eyes forgot Rudel. And as he sat in Avignon with princes at their wine, in all that lusty company was none so fresh and fine. His kirtles of the arras blue, his cap of pearls and green, his golden curls fall tumbling round the fairest face I've seen. How Gautier would have liked this from the same poem. Hew the timbers of sandalwood and planks of ivory, Rear up the shining masts of gold, and let us put to sea. Sew the sails with a silken thread, that all are silken too. Sew them with scarlet pomegranates upon a sheet of blue. Rig the ship with a rope of gold, and let us put to sea. And now good-bye to good Marseille, and hey for Tripoli. The ballad of the Duke of Gouldress's wedding is very clever. O welcome, Mary Harcourt, thrice welcome, lady mine. There's not a knight in all the world shall be as true as thine. There's venison in the ombre, Mary, there's claret in the vat. Come in and breakfast in the hall, where once my mother sat. 
O oh, red, red is the wine that flows, and sweet the minstrel's play, but white is Mary Harcourt upon her wedding day. O oh, many are the wedding guests that sit on either side, but pale below her crimson flowers, and homesick is the bride. Miss Robinson's critical sense is at once too sound and too subtle to allow her to think that any great renaissance of Romans will necessarily follow from the adoption of the ballad form in poetry. But her work in this style is very pretty and charming, and the Tower of St. Maur, which tells of the father who built up his little son in the wall of his castle in order that the foundations should stand sure, is admirable in its way. The few touches of archaism and language that she introduces are quite sufficient for their purpose, and though she fully appreciates the importance of the Celtic spirit in literature, she does not consider it necessary to talk of blowing and snoring. As for the garden play, Our Lady of the Broken Heart, as it is called, the bright bird-like snatches of song that break in here and there, as the singing does in Pippa Passes, form a very welcome relief to the somewhat ordinary movement of the blank verse, and suggest to us again where Miss Robinson's real power lies. Not a poet in the true creative sense, she is still a very perfect artist in poetry, using language as one might use a very precious material, and producing her best work by the rejection of the great themes and large intellectual motives that belong to fuller and richer song. When she essays such themes, she certainly fails. Her instrument is the reed, not the lyre. Only those should sing of death, whose song is stronger than death is. The collected poems of the author of John Halifax Gentleman have a pathetic interest as the artistic record of a very gracious and comely life. They bring us back to the days when Philip Bourke Marston was young, Philip my king, as she called him in the pretty poem of that name, to the days of the great exhibition with the universal piping about peace, to those later terrible Crimean days when Alma and Balaclava were words on the lips of our poets, and to days when Leonora was considered a very romantic name. Leonora, Leonora, how the word rolls, Leonora, lion-like and full-mouthed sound, marching o'er the metric ground, with a tawny tread sublime, so your name moves, Leonora, down my desert rhyme. Mrs. Craig's best poems are, on the whole, those that are written in blank verse and these, though not prosaic, remind one that prose was her true medium of expression. But some of the rhymed poems have considerable merit. These may serve as examples of Mrs. Craik's style. A Sketch Dost thou thus love me, O thou old beloved, in whose large store the very meanest coin would outbuy my whole wealth? Yet here thou comest like a kind heiress from her purple and down uprising, who for pity cannot sleep, but goes forth to the stranger at the gate, the beggared stranger at her beauteous gate, and clothes and feeds, scarce blessed till she has blessed. But dost thou love me, O thou pure of heart, whose very looks are prayers? What couldst thou see in this forsaken pool by the yew wood side, to sit down at its bank and dip thy hand, saying, It is so clear? And lo, ere long, its blackness caught the shimmer of thy wings, its slime slid downward from thy stainless palm, its depths grew still, that there thy form might rise. The Novice It is near morning, ere the next night fall I shall be made the bride of heaven, then home to my still marriage chamber I shall come, and spouseless, childless, watch the slow years crawl. These lips will never meet a softer touch than the stone crucifix I kiss. No child will clasp this neck. Ah, oh, virgin mother mild, thy painted bliss will mock me overmuch. This is the last time I shall twist the hair my mother's hand wreathed, till in dust she lay. Their name, her name given on my baptism day, this is the last time I shall ever bear. O oh, weary world, O oh, heavy life, farewell! Like a tired child that creeps into the dark To sob itself asleep where none will mark, So creep I to my silent convent cell. Friends, lovers whom I loved not, Kindly hearts who grieve that I should enter this still door, Grieve not, closing behind me evermore, Me from all anguish as all joy it parts. 
the volume chronicles the moods of a sweet and thoughtful nature, and though many things in it may seem somewhat old-fashioned, it is still very pleasant to read, and has a faint perfume of withered rose-leaves about it. Citations 1. A Book of Verses by William Ernest Henley David Nutt 2. Romantic Ballads and Poems of Fantasy by William Sharp Walter Scott 3. Poems, Ballads and a Garden Play by A. Mary F. Robinson Fisher Unwin 4. Poems by the author of John Halifax Gentleman Macmillan and Company End of section 72 A Note on Some Modern Poets